What's going on YouTube? It's Belton here. Um, coming with you guys with a really, really important video today. Um, one that I worked uh, quite hard on, spent several hours putting this together here. Um, it's a very, very dynamic topic, one that's got a lot of juice to it. Uh, and so I thought I'd take a different approach here. Um, and if you see the title I've got up on the stream, we're bringing it back, boys. PO Economics, first series I ever, uh, I ever made guides on several years ago. Uh, because uh, not only is it a classic all-time pun, but it is um, absolutely applicable to what we're going to discuss today. Uh, and that is probably the number one driver uh, for long-term wealth acquisition and POE for myself and for many other people. Um, whether or not you actually are cognizant of it, uh, many of you will actually be practicing this too. Uh, but we're going to dive into uh, investing in POE. Um, and I know the word has a lot of negative connotations surrounding it, so... Um, you know, one of the things we're going to do sort of foundationally here is, is lay out what I mean by this, uh, discuss what it is, uh, and really just lay, lay the groundwork or the framework um, for what I will discuss in future videos. Um, listening to your guys' feedback, uh, I'm going to try and make more concise videos that follow, not necessarily a script, but, um, you know, that have a, a, a cogent and coherent, coherent narrative um, that's a little bit more palpable and easy to follow. So uh, I put together a slideshow here, basically, uh, as well as some talking points. And we're basically in this first episode here going to kind of discuss what it is on a thematic sort of grand macro scale. Um, and then in subsequent videos, each one will sort of feed into the, the next. Um, and so, you know, if the topic resonates with you, you can kind of dive in further. Um, and with each one, we'll get more specific and more concise uh, and more targeted in, in the discussions. Now, uh, before I really dump, jump into that, uh, there's a couple of things I wanted to discuss first uh, and just give you guys kind of an update with what's going on with me. Um, as many of you know that are kind of tied into the channel and what's been going on with me, uh, whether through Discord or uh, the YouTube, um, I have been permanently banned again from Twitch. Uh, this actually happened while I was live uh, and while I was sitting at my computer rolling Synthesis Beasts. Um, the alleged infraction is for um, sharing of malicious software or phishing software, um, essentially links that they're purporting that I sent out with the intent of stealing users or viewers data. Um, I mean, obviously I know that this is patently false. Uh, not only um, do I have no you know, desire to do this, but uh, I, I certainly do not possess the, the technical know-how to even begin going about doing that. So, um, hopefully that uh, can be resolved. Uh, however, uh, you know, as a result of that happening again, uh, I did have to take a couple of days uh, to kind of blow off some steam, clear my head, um, and really kind of assess where I'm at with this whole thing. Um, and, uh, you know, one of the things I noticed is that... Uh, when I told you guys about this, whether it was Discord or on uh, YouTube, um, a lot of the feedback I got was incredibly supportive and positive, overwhelmingly so. Um, but, uh, you know, in the detractors, and there's always going to be some, um, and not necessarily without merit, by the way, uh, the one thing that was sort of a common theme was that um, it was deserving of me for this to happen uh, by virtue of how I was streaming. Uh, and so I thought I'd kind of clarify a couple of things. Uh, what they mean by that is that, you know, my stream was on 24 seven and often people would come in for situations where, you know, I'd be gone for hours at a time and, you know, chats unmoderated and there's nothing going on. I, I can understand hundred percent why that'd be frustrating, but, uh, just for some context here, um, when I left the military and moved back to my hometown, uh, I actually made a conscious decision that I, I wanted to kind of pursue, uh, I guess what you would call content creation for path of exile. Um, it was always a big what if for me, um, you know, when I left for the military and when I was called up to service, uh, it was kind of like at the peak of, my, I guess, my growing popularity. I was really just taking, um, you know, gaining a foothold and kind of getting into my groove. And, um, you know, I always sort of wondered what would have happened if I pursued that. Um, on top of that, you know, I have a deep, deep passion for the game. Uh, I've had a variety of different, uh, uh pursuits and, uh, you know, successes and failures in my life and um you know the one thing i've always found to be incredibly meaningful um and really purpose driven is uh, the time i spend on this game strangely enough um <clears throat> knowing the lack of uh, uh prospects or the at least the bleak outlook 
uh, of pursuing this on a you know on a day-to-day -day basis both you know in terms of time and focus and um what that would take away from my life uh i did set myself up you know comfortably for for about a year or so um and uh you know i started doing this about last march and so that that kind of cushion has somewhat been uh closing in on me rather uh, rather quickly here um so with respect to the twitch i i realized uh, pretty quickly uh after twitch reverted their sh uh, revenue split on subscribers um that they had a big push for ad revenue um and feeling kind of not gross but uh, you know the idea of asking people online that i don't know on a one-to-one -one basis to to pay for you know to send me money i always just found very off-putting and so i saw it somewhat as a victimless crime uh to just basically run my stream 24 7 and when i went afk i would just turn ads all the way up um and believe it or not uh it was actually uh not quite able to pay for my rent but um you know on, on a day if you if you were to prorate it over a month um what i was making simply by going afk uh from ads could almost pay for my rent and so that was um you know kind of a, a alleviating a, a pretty big burden for me uh, in that respect um and uh, you know again i saw it somewhat as a victimless crime even though i do understand the frustration of coming by when i'm not there um so you know <clears throat> when uh when the uh, tft or you know i i can't say de definitively it was them but when i was banned at christmas for someone spamming porn in my chat that obviously kind of threw a wrench in it um, however, you know, when I launched the YouTube channel, the success that came from there uh, kind of reinvigorated me. And then, you know, when I was unbanned from Twitch and they reverted, they reversed it. Uh, that really brought a, a breath of fresh air and, and renewed sense of vigor and purpose into what I was doing. Um, and, uh, you know, again, sort of enthusiastically uh, pursued that, um, you know, 150 subscribers in a couple of weeks, which was, you know, amazing. You know, 1500 followers or whatever it was really, really uh, affirming. Um, and it's not necessarily the metrics themselves, you know, the financial side itself. It's just to see that it's resonating with people uh, is very meaningful for me. And I know it might seem like, you know, I'm putting too much weight in this game. It's just a video game. But, uh, you know, my, my 20s were marked by um, lots of successes and, and sort of glorious uh, <laughs> recanting of events in my mind here. But uh, they were also marred by some pretty dark times, um, personal struggles and uh, you know, existential crises that really brought me to a threshold um, that, you know, many of the people I was with uh, at the time didn't uh, make it back from. And uh, I, I owe a lot of that to POE. And so it was like the one thing that was able to pull me away from uh, that negativity in my life that, uh, you know, had I not had that, that, you know, I'm, I might not be here today. So uh, I, I know that this game is more than a game to some people because it's more more than a game to me. And it has been historically so uh, that's really the root of the passion i have for this uh and i hope above all else i know sometimes i'm a little uh, unpolished that that comes across um, more than anything else but um you know with this new ban happening i have had to kind of take inventory uh and, and i've come to the conclusion that um you know it, it's silly for me to rely on a platform uh given what's been going on and so i'm going to be moving pretty much all my subscriptions and um, any kind of monetization over to Patreon. Um, I know right now my Patreon's not set up very well, or whatever. Um, and there's you know a few guys who who are supporting me on there, and I really really appreciate that. Um, it's very important to me, I think, as like a core value that uh, information people who want to improve and it, it, you know their experience in this game get better uh, are not gated behind paywalls. Um, and so with that in mind, uh, there's never going to be any benefits there that are not accessible on Twitch or otherwise, but, you know, things like early access or, uh, you know, written transcripts of the videos I put together or little one minute crafting videos, how to's or whatever, things like that are, are definitely in the cards. And, uh, again, by no means, I don't want this to feel like a sales pitch or anything like that, but, um, you know, uh, for those of you that uh, are able, willing, and, uh, you know, with whom the content resonates, um, I really uh, am eternally grateful for that support um, because uh, it allows me to have this uh, opportunity to have a platform uh, to share my passion with you guys um, and hopefully Im improve our collective experience. So um, I know that was a little bit of a, <laughs> a long preface there, but um, I just want to let you know, guys know where I was where I was at. And, uh, uh, you know, we're quickly approaching my 10 year anniversary with PoE now, uh, March 30th. That's what three days away. And, um, 
you know, can't help but be somewhat uh, uh, introspective and, and and look back, uh, uh, you know, when you have a, a benchmark like that. And I, I think that, um, you know, as, as hard as certain events have been, you know, I, I don't I don't view myself in my mind's eyes as someone that gives up. And, um, you know, I, I do find this to be meaningful. So I'm, I'm, I'm going to pursue it to the best of my ability and, um, you know, take uh, what you guys give me with feedback and try to be, um, you know, make the best content I can for you. So with that being said, you probably notice a new little layout here. I tried to make it a little bit cleaner. Um, got a new webcam and some lighting. Hopefully that's a little bit better. Um, and I also wrote a script. I actually spent five hours writing a script out for this. Um, so hopefully it's a little bit more uh, coherent uh, or, you know, clear to follow narrative. I will also put timestamps below um, the video so that anyone who wants to skip this whole preamble can just jump right into the information. But um, I thought it would be important to get that out of the way before uh, we start discussing the meat of it. But with that being said, uh, let, let's, uh, let's get into it, guys. And uh, thanks for listening there. So <clears throat> back to it, we're, uh, we're going to be discussing investing today uh, and actually in, in a series of videos uh, going forward from here. Uh, and so uh, we're going to be talking about unveiling the strategies that lead to long term, consistent financial success and individual player autonomy. So what is investing in POE? Um, the way that I define this is a conscious and deliberate allocation of assets uh, from one form to another with the expressed purpose of increasing relative purchasing power sometime in the future. Basically, taking money and trying to make more money from that um, without uh, the, the personal motives, right? The, the reason why you are purchasing that item or investing into that item um, is with the intention of allowing that to grow in terms of financial gain. Uh, POE at its core is a game of accumulation and opportunity cost. Uh, the vast majority of what we take possession of with respect to items, currency, and the likes are not in imme immediate direct need by our characters, perhaps with the exception of day one of a league, maybe day two as well. Um, in that respect, <clears throat> uh, they're simply representative tokens of barter that we, in principle, will either exchange with another player and or use at a later date. Conversely, we may also deem them unworthy of our time or ownership and simply discard or disregard all but a few key items. This is the basis of efficient gameplay, and honing this skill is one of the largest learning curves in the game. It is in this spirit that investing is introduced. By virtue of the hard reset that occurs every three to four months, with all players starting from zero, uh, there are a set of conditions that arise every league without any deviation that put our currency into the same measure uh, or into the same realm of opportunity cost as the player that owns it. In short, are we being efficient with our wealth? Um, so next we're going to just kind of go over, this is sort of the topics of the, the video here, um, but what are the underlying conditions that fuel this approach or that, you know, give merit to this approach we're about to discuss? Uh, so the first one is inflation, uh, purchasing power, uh, the controllable and uncontrollable variables, uh, risk aversion, gaps in knowledge or understanding, highly formulaic or cyclical markets, trends, and player priorities, um, non-participant or equally motivated actors, uh, aka the people that are playing just for fun, obviously are not going to operate uh, under the same guidelines or basal assumptions as somebody who is trying to min-max their, um, you know, their returns. Um, there's also a perceived sense of urgency to achieve certain benchmarks that are often counterproductive. Um, the, also, the inability of the player base at large to defer short-term rewards in spite of obvious benefit of, uh, over time is generally driven by this. Um, there's also the influence of community thought leaders, build creators, racers, high performers, and you know these are the people that I would call the arbiters of meta. You know, when we when we discuss the term meta, it is not a hard line codified, you know, objective analysis. Meta is simply um, the shifting values of the community reflected as a whole. Um, <clears throat> and uh, another underlying condition that unfortunately has a huge, huge factor, a uh, huge part to play in uh, why what we're about to discuss here is, is a very valid and successful approach um, is the presence of RMT 
and botting within the game. Um, and lastly, the disconnect in almost all of the above uh, will boil down to one core thing. And that is people tend to have a vigorous pursuit of the what in Path of Exile. So what build should I play? What tree? What skill? What map should I do? What atlas layout? Um, but, but very rarely is there, is there a deep consideration or concern for the why. You know, why do certain skills work best early? Why do certain builds scale well with, uh, into the late game? Why do certain builds get more expensive and ones get cheaper? Uh, why should I farm this map or over that one? You know, why should I craft this item instead of just buying it on the market, right? These are often things that are just conditioned behaviors that are very rarely of um, critical analysis and are generally just sort of fed to them by, again, those thought leaders or arbiters of the meta I discussed earlier. So let's get in the first thing that uh, is, is the primary cause for why investing is a really good idea in PoE, and that is inflation. So if we're to talk a hypothetical scenario here, 15 minutes into the start of a new league, day one, there are perhaps in total circulation in the entire league, 200 chaos orbs. If I want to buy, let's say, a gold rim or a tabula or, you know, whatever leveling item you want, uh, there's a good chance that you're going to be able or have an ability to acquire it. Um, after all, there's only 200 chaos orbs in the entire league, um, but there's dozens of different leveling uniques and thousands of other players. Now, fast forward only 15 minutes, 30 minutes into the league, day one. There are probably, in total circulation, now 2,000 chaos orbs. Uh, if I want to buy the same uniques mentioned above, there is much more competition. Exponentially more currency has entered the market. Player numbers, however, are pretty much the same, and the supply of unique items... Uh, has not kept pace with the increase in total currency. Um, this is because obviously people will equip these items typically, and currency very rarely is used, uh, especially early on. Um, you know, things like chaos cards and stuff like that. Transmutes and whatnot, obviously, uh, are more likely to be consumed. Um, <clears throat> this imbalance, uh, however, causes the price of items to rise. What could be bought with one chaos mere minutes earlier is now two chaos. Uh, this is just, again, a hypothetical scenario to kind of outline what we're discussing here. But eventually, um, with the above scenario levels out, um, there's going to be an impermanent utility for leveling uniques, and the supply will soon far outpace the demand. However, the cycle above will, will continue uh, and repeat itself uh, in different uh, avenues throughout the course of the league. Uh, the PoE development team's decision to not simply have gold like most games do or did as a representative measure of wealth or token for trade or barter is one of the only combatants to this getting out of hand. Um, as currency not only has a representative value in PoE, but it also has an intrinsic value uh, by virtue of its use case. Uh, this, this helps keeps things in check, um, as if a currency item becomes severely misaligned with its function, there will always be those who are quick to react and take advantage, take advantage of this disconnect. Um, and eventually, People will do that over and over uh, so rapidly that that disconnect or that gap will, will close very quickly. Um, for example, things like Mirrors of Calandra uh, are never going to cost a Chaos Orb because uh, of the function or you know the benefit that a Mirror of Calandra provides. Um, now, by virtue of each player's ever-growing capacity to generate currency from their own labors, so whether that's mapping, divination cards, you know, chaos rep recipes, uh, things like sanctums, etc. Um, and a relatively inadequate currency sink for the gold and silver standard currencies. Um, and by that, I mean the ones that are uh, traditionally used as the, um, you know, standard token for exchange, which is in the contemporary Path of Exile, divines and chaos orbs. Um, and in spite of the, uh, the topic or the point I made above, um, there are consistently more and more uh, of X orbs entering the economy. And X orbs could be uh, referred to anything. There, there are no orbs that uh, will suffer from um, deflation at this point, uh, really, or at any point throughout uh, the course of a league, with the exception perhaps in the last couple of days. Um, this inherently devalues that orb um, <clears throat> as, uh, in theory... The increased net outcome, uh, or sorry, the, the, the increased net income um, is, again, theoretically distributed to the whole player base equally. Um, and prices are, are going to rise until a supply and demand equilibrium is reached. Now, obviously, there is a huge gap um, 
wealth gap in Path of Exile, but the market does not reflect that, right? And this is why there's often a disconnect with uh, what people perceive uh, to be valuable or worth it, right? Um, you know, there are times where I'll spend 20 or 30 or 40 divines and not even blink, whereas with other people, you know, that's half of a headhunter, that that could be a goal for the league. Now, does our perception of that specific situation actually reflect the economic conditions of the market at large? No, it's purely looking through the lens of our experiences, um, you know, as we play the game day to day that is going to dictate that for ourselves. Um, and this is the root of a lot of players frustration. Um, you know, one of the cases I hear all the time, especially early league, is, you know, I'm going to get, let's say, a doctor card, the headhunter card, right? Uh, so I began to save, but when I looked again today, one day later, uh, the price had risen by more than I had earned in that same time span. So let's say they cost seven divines, and day one I had four. Day two, I, I'm up to six divines, but now the card is up to nine divines in cost. And it's like, you know, I, I can sense a deep frustration in a lot of people that, you know, the apple of their eye or the, the, the fruit of their pursuit, the thing that they're chasing after is seemingly... Um, you know, the carrot on the stick that they can never achieve. Um, you know, and, and I think a lot of people, this is at the core of why when I say the word investing, uh, some people are turned off because, you know, in, in their mind, it is this malicious activity of a few uh, bad actors or bad faith actors or groups of individuals who are looking to take advantage of people. Uh, and this is not the case. You know, people will have these moments where they're like, uh, you know, who's able to afford this stuff? What am I doing wrong? Um, the first answer uh, is a bit more complex. And, uh, you know, with respect to being able to afford things, um, it involves things like pooling of currencies, economies of scale, distributed labor force, uh, sorry, distributed labor and force multipliers that exist within group play and economic activity. Um, and I'll speak about that in a different video another time. But the second question is one where we should focus. And that's, you know, what am I doing wrong? And the fatal flaw, you are approaching the game as a measured relationship between input and output. And this is the path to ruin. Task efficiency is a noble pursuit and certainly has a great impact on your short-term financial outcomes. However, it is always going to be hard capped by your physical capacity to complete a task. And uh, what I mean by that, you know, things like load screens, uh, clicking, blinking, having to go to the bathroom, lag, um, you know, the actual time milliseconds it takes to move your wrist along a table um, this will always even if you had 100% performance and efficiency you will always have an inevitable ceiling uh, the investment into efficiency vis-a-vis -vis gear improvement uh, batch rolling atlas optimization etc will have a tremendous impact early on um, however the marginal cost of your improvement is low and the outcomes are high uh, these will slowly dwindle, however, as improvements and min-maxing become increasingly and eventually exponentially more expensive. So, for example, if you were to draw a number 1 in 100, uh, and these are just arbitrary markers of, of character optimization, to go from 1 to 50, it might cost you, you know, 50 chaos. To go from 50 to 75, it might cost you um, 500 chaos. To go from 75 to 90, it might cost you five divines to go from 90 to 95 might cost you 50 divines to go from 95 to 99 500 divines from 99 to 100 five mirrors you know again arbitrary numbers but highlights the point that i'm making the, the better your character gets the more expensive it will be to improve however you are going to plateau in terms of the the uh, investment versus reward and in fact when I'm discussing input and output there, I think it, it's important to illustrate for a second what I mean. You guys see this? So, if we have time and value expressed on an X, Y axis, like, can you guys see that? This, <clears throat> initially, the more time we spend in something, right, we have an increase in time and that directly correlates with the increase of value, right? So this is day one, day two, day three, day four. The more time we spend, the more we are earning, right? And each one of these days is being separated by um, a universal, uh, or, you know, a, a measured and equal period, right? So 
one day, one day, one day. So we might be improving 50% day over day, right? But after about day four, day five in the league, if you're playing quite a bit, you're gonna start to slowly peak, right? And the more time you spent, the less and less marginal improvement you are going to see. Now, does that mean you're wasting your time? No, not necessarily. It's just by virtue of how the game is and by how gearing works and by the fact, you know, the higher end your gear gets and the higher level your character gets, the less potential there is for net improvement. And so because of that, um, again, we will eventually plateau. And regardless, even if you do end up spiking and hitting that 100% measure here, you are always going to have a ceiling. You will never be able to surpass this because this is time. And the time is not something that you can bend in any sense of the word. Uh, again, and that is a physical limitation. And since, you know, at the core of efficiency or the core of the game, as I mentioned earlier, is opportunity cost, uh, accumulation, and efficiency of effort, we try to find a way to bypass this. So that's where we get into the solution. The previous conclusion that I just said there might seem bleak, but fear not as uh, our salvation is not hidden beneath layers of complexity or high involvement tasks demanding inhumane optimization to function. Uh, another sort of quick tangent here um, is that a lot of, uh, uh, you know, these theoretical scenarios involving min-maxing or mapping um, are, are almost torturous to myself when I think about them. It's like, okay, you can make 50 divines an hour farming crimson temples, but you can't go to the bathroom, blink, talk to anybody. You have to pre-roll your maps. You can have no lag. You need an SSD. You have to play one of three builds uh, with four exact scarabs. And it's like, man, like at what point, you know, does that um, kind of surpass the actual intent of the game, which really at its core should be fun. Uh, and if you remember the title, uh, I said... The, the title of the, uh, the, the slideshow here was um, Individual Player Autonomy. And when I discuss wealth in this game, it's not through the lens of wanting to flex or EPing or RMT or whatever other individual um, you know, benchmarks players might set for themselves. At, at the core, what currency allows you to do in Path of Exile is to play how, uh, how you like, what builds you like, uh, how efficiently you like, what maps you like. Um, it's almost become a meme at this point, uh, how bad I am at the game. And people point it out to me all the time and it always makes me laugh, right? Because, the, oh man, you're playing a 35 mirror discharge build? Like, I can clear a map with 20 divines on my seismic trap or it's better than this. I'm like, all right, that's cool, man. How long did you play the league for? Like, man, like 10 days. Fucking hate seismic trapper. <laughs> and I'm like, yo, ding, ding, ding. Uh, but, you know, cognitive dissonance is sometimes uh, a hard... Uh, a hard pill to swallow uh, anyways um i digress simply put we want to be efficient uh the measure is a relationship between time outcome and return uh our, our sorry time outcome or return our goal then is to spend as little little physical time as possible to generate as much wealth as possible uh, this is the the case with mapping this is the case with trading this is the case with everything you do in poe uh, so here are some telltale signs um, that the following strategies of investment um, are probably things that you should consider. Um, and if these thoughts have ever crossed your mind, check them off. Um, I am holding wealth and items uh, that are losing value with the passage of time. So I'm running maps. I'm running maps. I've got the gear that I need right now. And I've just got divine chaos orb stacks that are going up and up, but they're not doing anything. Um, and, you know, the situation we described with the Headhunter card or a Mirror Shard, where the items you eventually want to buy are outpacing, um, you know, the items because of inflation and because of the devaluation of basal currency. Um, the bulk, number two, the bulk of my assets outside of my character's gear are not in use at any given time. In essence, I am not actively crafting, flipping, bulk selling, harvest reforging, etc., Number three, I am plateauing or at worst being or worse being outpaced by the price of the items I want to buy despite attempts to improve my character's capacity to kill or be efficient uh, as a means of economic production or as a primary means of e economic production. Uh, and in, in layman's terms, 
you know, the, pro the, the main way that I make money is by killing mobs in maps. And that's my, you know, my singular avenue of, of generating currency, uh, which again is the means by which we improve our characters. Uh, number four, often there are gaps of time where I save up currency to afford my next upgrade. Uh, and as a result, I don't spend at all or I spend very little in anticipation of this event. And this is one that I see all the time. People will be saving for, let's say, a mage blood. It costs three or four hundred divines. It'll take them a week and a half. And for a week and a half, you know, day one, five divines, day two, eight divines, day three, 14 divines. And that money just sits there and it rots and it depreciates. Um, I mean, this is, again, sorry, I, I don't want to bring up real world financial markets too much, but this is the basis for why people invest to begin with is that, um, by virtue of how money is generated in the real world through um you know the federal banks and uh over time there is more physical currency inserted into the economy and because of that the purchasing power of the dollar constantly drops this is um you know base inflation which uh, you know if you've been paying attention over the past couple of years has gotten kind of out of hand so if you can have uh, one dollar let's say and you can buy a chocolate bar uh for one dollar and you go and put that $1 into a savings account in the bank that uh, gives you 2% interest. And the next year you withdraw it because you want to have a chocolate bar a year later on the date. I don't know why I'm picking this analogy. I guess I'm just a fat boy. But regardless, if that chocolate bar now costs a dollar and six cents and you've only been given back a dollar and two cents from the bank, even though you've gained 2% on, on what you deposited, uh, your relative ability to purchase the things that you want um, has actually gone down, right? And so this is why people seek to invest in the real world is to, uh, on a base level, obviously people want to accumulate generational wealth and, and compounding rates of return, etc. cetera. But, um, you know, the ceiling of ambition is much higher, but on, on the floor level, it is simply to outpace inflation. Um, and again, exactly the same thing that we're trying to do here. So, um, the fifth thing that you should uh, be uh, cautious of if you were ever having this cross your mind, um, I tend to avoid situations of uncertainty as a way to mitigate risk. For example, I sell all of my locus of corruptions from Alva temples rather than running them. Uh, I will level enlightens to level three and sell them uncorrupted. I buy upgrades rather than crafting them. Um, now the solution part two, what we're going to do is take our superfluous resources. So that means things that we don't immediately need, um, things that are stagnant, plateauing or depreciating assets. And we're going to use them to purchase items for the sole and expressed purpose of our expectation that the, their price will go up over time and that we will be able to sell them in a timely manner, uh, for more than we paid. This time frame is going to vary case by case and will largely have to do with access to liquidity, uh, but it can generally be categorized into a few uh, a few types of, of uh, asset investments. And these, these are just loose terms that I kind of refer to them as. These are not hard line specific things, but uh, as a result, I'll explain what each one means uh, in the following slide. But um, I would categorize them into highly liquid items, liquid items, marketable items, niche items, speculative items, and growth items. Um, in short, yeah, each bears with it a certain expectation of turnaround time, margin, and risk. Generally speaking, the faster that something sells, the smaller the margins. However, the compounding nature of highly mobile investments can quickly surpass even the greatest of investments on a one-to-one -one basis. So now let's define what I, these asset classes I described. So when I say something that's highly liquid, I'm talking about something that can usually sell within 30 minutes to an hour. Uh, these are omnipresent market items uh, with constantly with buyers and sellers actively participating in that market at all times. Uh, examples of these things would be uh, raw currency items like, you know, chaos, divines, exalts, etc. Things like essences and fossils, things where there are always going to be a market for them. Now, liquid items, these are things that I would say, uh, by my definition, would sell within one to six hours. These are highly sought after common items, generally with an established market price or a price range. Uh, good examples of these would be gems or unique items. Uh, third category, and this is tend to be, tends to be the, the, the middle ground that I put a lot of my time and my currency into, uh, and that's what I would define as marketable items. 
Um, so for a marketable item, I'm looking at a six to 24 hour turnaround. Uh, and these are items that are often rare, uh, but they're easily discernible in their use case with a steady market of interested parties. Um, so I'm not talking about like you just pick up some random rare and you're like, oh my God, it's got T1 Fizz, T1 Mana, uh, T1 Dexterity, T1 Stun Duration, and um, you know, fucking Mathel used it six and a half years ago. Like bless up. You know, like that's just, it, it doesn't, <laughs> it, cool, it might be 61, but it doesn't have a defined and obvious use case. What I'm talking about here are things like a, a PDPS spine bow or a flask where there is an obvious and clear interest pretty much at all times by um, a, a relatively represented uh, and, and active uh, market on the buy side. Now, going on to niche items. These are ones that I would say usually sell within one to three days. Uh, these are items that have an obvious and identifiable use case. However, due to their rarity or applicability to less common skills, will have a smaller market. Often, however, these are the most motivated buyers, as those who seek these items are doing so out of their inherent with their inherent rarity in mind. Um, for example, certain corruptions on uniques, you know, a, a, a very specific double corruption, let's say on an Omni uh, or discharge gear, right? Um, myself, using myself as a prime example, I, I will pay absurd amounts of money for discharge gear. Uh, and it's not because I, I don't know what it probably costs that person. It's just there's no one else selling it, right? And so it's kind of, well, it, option one is how, you know, you get nothing and leave with nothing and you don't improve at all. Or option two is you suck it up and you pay them what they want. And so niche items, again, while they move a little bit slower, they can actually have very, 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 uh, very high margins on them. Uh, now, the next category I would talk about are speculative items. Um, these are usually going to sell when the seller decides the time is right. These items are invested into generally on the basis of an inductive reasoning, uh, historical data or trends or anticipated market movements. Uh, for example, I, I had one of these investments recently where I purchased uh, 12 original sins um, and, and my inductive reasoning was that um, you know, they've stated that Sanctum is not going core. Uh, it's a very strong build enabling unique. Um, people are going to get worried and, and about, you know, the legacy aspect of it or potentially not being able to acquire it in the future. Um, and so if I buy this a couple of weeks ahead of time, um, you know, the people who are going to, you know, finish their challenges or, you know, finish improving their characters, and that's where their bulk of their money is going to go right now. Once they get that done, they're going to start buying these things uh, for collector's sake or for long-term standard stake, right? Um, and that uh, influx of, of demand uh, will cause the, the price to go, um, you know, hopefully parabolically higher. And so this was, again, the, the inductive reasoning I had for this, uh, speculative in nature, but um, informed by my observations historically of these kinds of items. And um, I think with a fairly, um, you know, easy to stand by reasoning uh and lo and behold it, uh it ended up being the case uh the 12 original sins i purchased at a average cost of 105 divines uh they're now 200 divines each and that's about nine days later um and so for something that probably took me around 15 minutes of time the physical amount of investment of time it took me to actually go and purchase each individual ring uh i made two mirrors and regardless of what anyone wants to say about mapping and i know it's more fun and i know for some people it, it's you know against the ethos of the game or an action RPG to, to discuss these financial matters. And, you know, to those people, there's probably no convincing them anyways, but to those who, who do have a legitimate uh, concern and uh, interest for comparing things one-to-one, -one, um, you know, that situation itself is really all you need to know. 15 minutes for two mirrors. Um, let's see that happen in a map, right? I mean, you know, outside of a, a one in a billion circumstance where you get like a double currency drop on a mirror. Uh, point of note, by the way, I've played for 20,000 hours in 10 years and I've never had a mirror drop. That being said, I don't kill mobs that much. Guilty as charged. Um, anyways, yeah, that's a speculative item. Um, and now the last, <clears throat> the last category I would refer to as growth items. Um, these will usually sell when they re reach their optimal use case. Uh, these items are going to be purchased in advance of their peak demand, um, often far before uh, and they're held onto with the knowledge that they're typically mid to late uh, league or late game oriented uh, and therefore will be in peak relative demand at a future date. And this is obviously going to vary item to item. Um, for example, good synthesis bases, uh, plus one level uh, awakened gems, 
uh, ex exceptional ones in particular, you know, level five, uh, Awaken Enhance, Empower and uh, Enlighten, um, one passive voices, um, cluster jewel bases, uh, item level restrictive ones, or item level 84, 12 passives, um, and certain fractures are good examples of these. Uh, <clears throat> now, another thing we want to discuss uh, as, as like a base approach, uh, an important topic is diversification and uh, hedging risk. So the previous types of investments can be put into uh, practice mere moments after the start of a league. Um, I'll give several examples uh, on the last slide of, of this first video here. Um, and keep in mind, I am going to do this as a series just so it's not too information dense in one video. Uh, this topic I could go on about for literally dozens of hours. Um, but uh, again, one of the big things I think is important to kind of um, understand here is that you should not be avoidant um, of this due to a perception of lack of wealth or personal inadequacy or lack of understanding as a player. Uh, in fact, the best opportunities um, with respect to uh, investments uh, are often, um, you know, one to five chaos purchases made within the first few days of the league. Uh, my best ever return that I've had playing PoE uh, was a 1,014 chaos that I invested. Uh, and I actualized that investment six days later uh, for one mirror. So, uh, yeah, 1,000 chaos into one mirror in six days. Uh, the 1,000 chaos, uh, sorry, 1,014 chaos to be specific, um, was comprised of no individual purchase greater than 25 C each. So it wasn't like I found some crazy sick synth base that somebody misvalued. It was 40 or 50 little, I was at the specifically tempering orbs at the time um, that I, you know I knew were going to be valuable very shortly, uh, but I thought were uh, misvalued at the current market price. Um, and so rather than you know spend 50 chaos on uh, you know uh, cold iron point that was going to be five chaos 24 hours from now you know we invest that we make a conscious decision to purchase something for the expressed uh intention uh with the expressed intention uh of being able to sell it at a much higher uh price point at a later date um, as i defined investing so when we get into this though one of the things you want to be uh definitely um, cognizant of and, and adapt into your strategy uh is diversification so it's important to understand um now severely mitigated compared to capital markets but present nonetheless uh the risk that any individual investment will hold uh things are occasionally nerfed new items are added interactions are changed uh the game is dynamic and ever changing um and the markets are responsive in accordance to that uh, with that in mind i highly suggest uh, you diversify into at least three to five different avenues at any given time not only in terms of the actual item but also um time frames you know i personally like to commit about 10 percent of what i invest into growth or speculative items, uh, as these tend to be your, you know, your home runs, the ones that are going to give you 50 or 100 times what you spent on them. Um, but the bulk uh, I like to keep for, you know, highly liquid uh, to marketable, like that range as I define them, ones that are in the range of highly liquid uh, to marketable. So that would be, you know, currency, gems, uh, uniques, and then you know, easily sellable rares. Um, you, you never know, and the reason for this is that you never really know when a good opportunity will present itself uh, or the perfect item might appear on the market. Um, and you don't want to be locked out of that opportunity because you decide to go all in on like an achievement unique that isn't going to be needed for 75 days because you were able to buy it for 10 seed. You know it's going to be five divines on, on day 85 of the league, but there's not a single goddamn person that wants to buy it for at least another 35 days. And I've actually been in these situations before where I'm like, man, this is so undervalued. I'm just going to go fucking buy all of them. And then I've seen things pop up on the market and I, I, I cannot uh, liquidate my investments because, um, you know, while they were informed by logic and reason and uh, they had a specific raison d'etre and they did end up, you know, materializing uh, very well, um, I, I locked myself out by being too... Um, singularly focused in, in not only the time frame but the item itself um, and so that really is at the core of why um, you should consider diversifying on top of you know the propensity for the game to constantly make change so hedging risk what does that mean um, it's a, a good way to mitigate uh, downside exposure on any investment that has elements of RNG to it um, calculable or not is by calculating the average outcome to determine uh, to, sorry, to determine a net favorability 
uh, and then break even points. And then also to figure out your worst case scenario. Uh, if there's a high capital requirement, for example, um, Awakened Enlightens, if you're going to try and double corrupt these to get plus one level. If they're 40 divines each, um, and then you know that hitting plus one level is a one in four corruption, um, and then they sell for 10 divines at level four, which is the bricked level, um, and they sell for 200 divines at level five, um, an average scenario, right? So again, it's not there's going to be variance the smaller the sample size, but on average, if you were to run four times, two of them would have no effect, one of them would go plus one level, and one of them would go minus quality or minus level. And that final scenario is actually meaningless with exceptional gems because minus quality has no impact and the level you can simply equip the gem and uh, re-level re it. Um, so that means three of them are going to be worth 10 divines. One will be worth 200. And so uh, you add that together, 230 divines, and then you minus your average cost. So there are 40 divines each. You add four of them, 230 minus 160 is a 70 divine profit. So we can see that uh, this scenario, uh, that the average return of pursuing this RNG element uh, is very promising. Um, however, 40 divines is, uh, is quite a high upfront cost uh, and the variance on a 25% success rate um, could be astronomical in relative terms. Uh, my, I myself have actually gone 13 awakened uh, enlightens in a row without hitting a plus one before. Um, and you know without consideration for hedging this risk or for alternative strategies or diversification um that could absolutely cripple or, or like just destroy uh any level of success or um you know relative wealth that one might have at any given point in the league uh not only that but it's incredibly demotivating and uh, i think in a lot of cases uh, might be a you know causal reason for someone to quit so we can avoid that um by hedging our risk and considering the long-term value curve of the items that we are investing into and so how do we do this well by looking at past league data we can see that the gem has a steady and continuous appreciation curve throughout the course of the league uh, more than tripling from week one to three to week eight to eleven right so knowing this we can confidently decide to ex accept the risk reward as i just laid out in that scenario um because that we know we know that given a large enough sample size right given the probabilities um that we will always profit but even uh if we have a spurt of ill-fated rng uh we're protecting our investment by understanding uh its relationship to time and price so by that i mean if we corrupted four of them and uh you know or sorry we corrupted three and three of them brick right and we're worried about losing our currency on that fourth one what we can do is, is rather than just eat that loss, we can just hold on to that fourth one and know that even though we might have lost 30 divines each on those previous ones, uh, we could just sell the gem, you know, four weeks from now and make all that money back or three weeks from now and make all the money back, right? There, there's ways you can balance this. Um, or you could obviously just double corrupt it and then look at the price of a, a, a level four awakened enlightened. But, um, you know, so this is this is a very easy way to do that. Uh, you can just take a look um, again at the current league, uh, see the, the the trend, the relationship to on the X Y axis of, of time and price. Uh, you can also look at the previous league, uh, as well as there's poeantiquary.com, which will show for most popular items uh, historical league data on those as well. And that's what uh, the difference in these two graphs here. That's uh, this is poe ninja and the. Uh, the one on the right there from Quadro League is from Antiquary. Um, and I mentioned a couple other factors uh, at the beginning of the video that um, uh, I'm just going to briefly uh, brush over here um, because I am realizing the time of the video. Um, so I already mentioned that just for fun crowd, uh, some players are simply uh, playing to blow off some steam a couple hours a weekend. They do not care about maximizing return or whether or not something is insane for some build they've never heard of. Uh, you know, they'll take the two divines right now so they can buy an item to play with their buddy for a couple hours, uh, even if that item is worth 20 divines. A player like this will not operate as a rational consumer in any economic model or analysis. Uh, they're technically outliers, but uh, they aren't rare to see, especially early on, um, which I realize is somewhat of a paradox. Um, now, controllable and uncontrollable variables. Uh, this is what I would define as the paradoxical relationship whereby uh, most people actually tend to tie their financial outcomes 
uh, to things that are the least calculable or controlled. Um, so, you know, with the onset of a new league, right, they'll try out new builds or new gems or, or new maps or, or, or new things like that. Um, uh, and ironically, um, in situations like this, uh, players, uh, in, uh, in particular amongst the fray and excitement of a brand new league, um, are actually often the most reliable and predictable actors in the uh, market at the time. Um, most of the like dissent or you know uh, dissenting opinions I read about the, the way that I approach this um, on things like Reddit or, or you know talk to people in game from like that anti you know the anti trade crowd um, or the anti crafting crowd uh, has to do with their perception of uh, you know layered RNG or how how crafting is just gambling or it's just a slot machine and um, you know blah 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 um, and, and you know the the irony of this is of course that um, a, it's not the case you can actually codify and specifically measure out the you know the average uh, material cost the material cost times the probability look at the sale price and make an informed decision whether or not something is worthwhile which is actually a far more calculable situation uh, and determinant one than something like mapping is uh, especially when there are factors like uh, you know uh, new skills or new maps or whatever going or new mechanics from leagues um, that there are unknown um, you know uh, being present um, so again, th th these are, are stances that are uh, polar opposite to reality. Um, another thing I mentioned too was uh, cyclical market. I'm <clears throat> sorry, pardon me, cyclical markets. So every three to four months we get a new league. Uh, and with new leagues come changes, buffs, nerfs, new mechanics, uh, etc. These are the things that people tend to focus on. Um, and uh, these are obviously the driving force for player retention and uh, they're a pleasure to learn, right? That's the fun part of the game for the most part. Uh, but they are, however, often uh, overstated in terms of their impact. Uh, 90 to 95 percent of items, skills, value curves, uh, player priorities, uh, and what people are going to pursue uh, remain part and parcel with what they have been previously. Uh, over time, this recognition of these patterns just sort of becomes subconscious, um, and and your investment will follow suit, right? Um, for myself now, I don't actually, I, I very rarely am ever, ever like, um, cognitively thinking about, okay, let's invest our currency. It is simply something I do by second na uh, nature now. Uh, and a lot of that has been informed by, um, you know, the, the extreme amount of hours and time and duration that I played the game. But a lot of it too, is just picking up on pattern recognition and discussing things with other players. Um, and you know, that's why it's important to have and to accept uh, those with different standpoints too, right? Because um, even if you don't agree with somebody, understanding how and why they think so a certain way um, can provide you insights in, into uh, uh, things that will directly benefit you in the future. Uh, like for example, I, I would never play a minion trap, mine, or totem build. Like the idea is abhorrent to me with respect to like, I, I want to be feel my character get stronger, not run around in circles while somebody else kills it, right? Um, because of that, I've never actually played one of these builds. So am I going to know firsthand what the priorities are or, you know, uh, what the, like, these weird sort of niche items that people would pay, you know, hand over fist for? No, right? So I can talk to somebody who loves those builds, let's say arbitrarily, let's say somebody like Gazi who loves minions, right? Um, recognizing that him and I have, you know, diametrically opposing views on this certain topic by, by listening and trying to understand him. Um, I can I can now, you know, add that to my Rolodex of knowledge, um, and then you know make future decisions around that. So, you know, even though it can be frustrating at times, especially on the internet, um, you know, try, try to take the time to, uh, to to always build upon your uh, your, your basis of knowledge. Uh, I also mentioned something called the pervasive sense of urgency. Um, Basically, uh, it tends to frame things in a very short window, uh, even if a person plays, uh, intends to play the game for a very long time. Uh, I think this is the impact that, you know, the thought leaders or um, market makers or uh, meta arbiters, as I described them earlier, uh, have on people. But someone will watch somebody like Havoc, uh, you know, who's one of the best racers in the world who, you know, hits level 100 in like 36 hours. Um, and what he's prioritizing and what he's going after and what gear he's going and build he's playing and, and like it's like joe schmo who's played the game for six and a half months and, and still has to read build guides um and he's like okay this is exactly we have the exact same um you know motive basis here uh and our, our needs and our um you know our, our 
situation or our circumstances are are one to one paralleled, um, and it's obviously ludicrous, right? Um, for the vast majority of people, uh, you know, this this sense of urgency is driven obviously by like excitement, but also partially like jealousy or FOMO. You know, you see somebody doing better, and like that relativism kind of drives a, a competitive uh, flame within us. But um, if you know that you are going to be playing for more than a week or two weeks, um, tr try to take some time, pause. And, you know, think about what the repercussions will be of individual actions. Um, anyways, this sense of urgency uh, will often cause people to think or act irrationally uh, with respect to deferral of short-term benefit. For example, uh, those who buy a six-link chest for one to three divines in the first 24 hours of a league uh, when they sell for five to ten chaos, uh, like on hour 72 of a league. Uh, that money reinvested appropriately into a rapidly appreciating asset. Uh, would leave them with 100 to 200 times the money. And I mean that quite literally. Um, there would be a performance benefit naturally uh, to having a six link versus a five link uh, for one to two days. However, this would be marginal and, and easily overcome by using something like a tabula or a corrupted six link that you know drops from a chest that you can get for five or 10 C. Um, and this is a big one too that uh, you know I didn't really want to discuss because uh, I find that it's, it's kind of a loaded and taboo topic in PoE, especially after the stuff I discussed with the, t the you know the TFT um, the TFT video. I don't I don't want to be like the RMT guy. Uh, not that I've ever RMT, but like I don't want to you know I, I don't want to be discussing that on a consistent basis as a as a driving um, you know force for viewership. Uh, but it, it is important to mention. Um, however, uh, it, it plays a massive role in supporting. Uh, the, the use case and the justification for making the decision to invest your currency. Um, because and you, this is very just simple logic. The vast majority of people who are going to purchase currency are going to do just that. They are going to go to these websites and they are going to purchase currency. Um, <clears throat> and that money needs to go somewhere. So often it's going to be going towards um, the rares that they likely do not possess the skill, uh, know-how, or uh, time to to create themselves, um, and it's much better to be in a position position of leverage uh, when competing against those uh, who completely bypass the core ethos of a game and genre, which is you know opportunity cost or grinding to improve uh, your character through uh, the fruits of your labor. Um, and holding items will, uh, you know, naturally, it's never going to fully shelter you from the impacts um, that these actors will have on the economy. Um, however, uh, you know, it is you're going to be far more insulated um, than if you're trying to actively compete with these same people uh, by stacking up the same currency as they are. Uh, for example, um, if some guy goes and RMTs 250 divines, um, and I've got 250 divines. Uh, you know, and a mage blood costs 200 and there's only one of them for sale. Uh, that guy will say, and you both try to buy it at the same time. Sure as shit, that dude's going to say, oh, I'll give you 220 instead because there's no, there's, there's the disconnect. There's no, uh, you know, the, the, the ease in which it was obtained, um, uh, completely removes that person from the relative value of it. And like this issue is, is, is far more pervasive than people I think recognize, um, as a result of the TFT video, I probably had 75 people uh, message me telling me that they, uh, you know, that they are RMT or that they have groups of friends that are RMT, and they ask for their names to not be included or anything. And they're they're not, they're not community members. They're like they're community members, but they're not, you know, big people in the community. But they just wanted to sort of shed a light on it. And um, you know, even when I do mirror service, I would say one in three people I can very clearly tell have RMT because they'll be on a level 15 character with no gear on it, and like they'll ask me what what they're buying, you know one of the best bows in the history of the game. And they're asking me like what amulet they should use. And it, it's, it's, it's hard to not, or, you know, even something as simple as buying currency off of a, a currency flipping bot, right? These, these are things where it's hard to measure your own self-interest and, you know, personal prerogatives against the well-being of the game as a whole. And, um, you know, in that, in that respect, uh, I judge no one. Um, and again, with the things I've brought up in the past, my, my, chief complaint with TFT is um, their, in my mind, misrepresentation of themselves as being a community tool or a community asset. You know, TFT is kind of like a venereal disease ridden hooker, right? It's awesome until it isn't. And uh, I think when you pull back the curtain on, on this, uh, it's it's actually quite disheartening. So um, yeah, one of, the, one of the things definitely 
uh, you can avoid, you know, avoid that with, or at least capitalize on it, um, is by holding currency in invested items as opposed to simply raw currency. And uh, this is actually the last slide of the video here, guys. Looks like we're going to pull in right around one hour. So uh, I guess I didn't do any better than I normally do, but I think we covered quite a bit here. Um, I know people are probably going to want specifics. And again, this is going to be a, a series of videos that I've released, each one going further into different veins of the topic. Um, so that way people can kind of, you know, peel back the onion and, uh, you know, go to deep dive as, as they wish, rather than me just dumping something into like a five hour video and being like, have fun kids. Um, but just as a, you know, as um, a demonstration of what I'm talking about, here are some uh, quick examples that come to mind for investments that I've made um, that have worked out well. So uh, I think I mentioned this one earlier, but I bought 44 tempering orbs for an average cost of 28 chaos. Uh, I then took a four day break from the game. Uh, I returned and they were, I think, four divines each. I sold them for a mirror uh, straight up the, the 1014 chaos or whatever it was uh, for one mirror. Um, I bought a hundred times a uh, I, item level 50 to 67, eight passive 10% attack clusters for one to two chaos each. Uh, I usually sell about a quarter of those four days or five days later for about 25 C each. Uh, another quarter of them about two weeks later for about 100 chaos each. Uh, and the rest I craft myself and will sell for three to five divines depending on the price of um, fossils. And uh, the market for those ones is always pretty much there because uh, it's used by uh, uh, bow builds, <laughs> uh, which are always popular. Um, and I've been doing this every league probably since I returned from the army, uh, doing that with the, the, the passive or sorry, cluster bases are an incredibly, incredibly, incredibly powerful thing to invest in early on. Um, and that's again, simply a matter of logic. Uh, what do cluster jewels require typically level 90 to 95 to be used meaningfully? And what does that require time, right? So people aren't really going to be, you know, actively going after these things, um, for the first few days of the league. However, especially if they're item level restricted, what do people do early league? Well, they run a lot of heist, right? Heist is a very common thing for people to do to get currency. Um, and where can you get item level restricted cluster jewels? From heist. So you have the all time high of supply, the all time low of demand, uh, and that relationship very rapidly changes. Um, and, and it's very easily measurable and identifiable in every league. And I welcome anyone to go and look at that. It is astronomical, literally 100 to one returns within one to two weeks. Um, another example, original sin, as I mentioned earlier, about 12 for 105 divines each average sold nine days later for a 95, <clears throat> 95 divine profit per ring for a 2.5 mirror profit over nine days. Um, this one is, is kind of a combination of, of, of a, a different strategies, but, um, with a very early league focus about 25 minutes into the league. Um, I will go and farm Einhar in that first zone that he appears in. Um, I, I can't remember the one, but it's an act two. Uh, until I get a red beast, 99% um, of the time, that red beast will allow you to craft a unique item. Uh, I will then sell that unique item for two divine, or sorry, two chaos. I use that chaos to buy jeweler's orbs for 25 to 31 chaos, 30, sorry, 25 to 30 chaos each. Um, I will then convert those jewelers uh, into fusings at the vendor uh, for four to one, which means I'm getting 6.25 to 7.5 uh, to one fusings per one chaos. Uh, and then I will then convert those fuse again into chance orbs. Um, and the reason for this uh, is that, um, and sorry, th that conversion from fuse to chance is one to one. So that means for one chaos, we would be getting 6.25 to 7.5 chance each. Uh, and the reason for this is if we wait four to five hours, uh, people will begin heisting and people will begin hitting maps. And chance orbs are used to buy heist contracts and they are used to buy maps from Kyrak. Now this is a very short window, usually one to two days at most, uh, but the price of chance orbs will go to three to one. Uh, and again, we were paying, uh, what we get 7.5 to one. So you're talking about something that you can rapidly compound. So, but, and not just with a small margin though, right? We can spend 10 chaos, uh, and turn it into 22 chaos. And we can do that, uh, exact process of doubling and doubling and doubling, um, maybe once every three or four minutes because it's currency items. It's in that highly liquid investment thing I was talking about. Uh, now my, some people might prefer to this as currency flipping, um, but because it does involve that process of, uh, you know, the deferral, um, getting ahead of the market, uh, as well, uh, with an expressive purpose, uh, a time frame for exiting. Um, I, I would say it probably classifies more as an investment. Um, but just to give an example that is not uh, you know, making 55 mirrors, this is something you can literally do with any amount of starting money. 
uh, in fact, by the time I finished uh, uh, the uh, Acts, so by the, by the time I finished Act 10, I think I had 10 or 12 Divines on me. Uh, so 7 or 8 hours in the League, I had 10 or 12 Divines simply by doing simple actions like that. Uh, another good uh, example, Weekend 1 of Sentinel League. Uh, nobody understood how Recombinators work. This is a very common theme for any new League mechanic. Um, very often they are misunderstood or not fully um, fleshed out early on. Um, this uh, recombinators were definitely a case of this. Uh, they were being two. They were two to three chaos each on the opening weekend. Uh, I too was unaware entirely of, of how they best functioned. Um, but I, you know, they tease they tease the items that can be made from these, right? Like they were showing power charge rings and frenzy charge rings and all this crazy gear. And these are obviously the things that create those. Uh, and so in my mind, I was like, this is absolutely absurd. There's no way that these are going to remain this. I, I, I'm just going to buy a bunch of them, put all of my currency into these recombinators. And then, you know, as soon as somebody figures it out, either I'll make them myself or I can sell them. And uh, lo and behold, the next weekend, I figured out how to do it. Uh, and I ended up with a thousand exalts. Uh, this was from an investment of approximately 450 to 500 chaos. Uh, exalts being what divines are now during that league. Um, so we're talking about 50 or 60 uh, times my return, um, you know, simply by going into the league item. Uh, somewhat speculative in nature, although I would say that with a 95%, 95 to 99% degree of certainty, league items will almost always uh, have a uh, appreciating value curve, in particular because they tend to be things that um, uh, are not uh, introduced to the uh, core game with the same uh, degree of ease or strength as they are in the league itself. Or in some cases, they're just completely removed from the core elements of the game. So because of that, um, you know, dwindling and, uh, uh, you know, non-impermanence uh, of, uh, of those items, uh, you obviously have um, a huge, huge uh, demand spike towards the end. Um, all right, another investment. Uh, this is one that I do pretty much every league, actually. Uh, purchasing plus one power charge rings in the first two to three weeks. Uh, this is, By this, I mean synthesis rings, but it does apply as well to the... Um, Oh, I always forget the name of these ones. Um, sorry, it didn't plug me. Precursors, sorry. <laughs> it was like an itch I had to scratch. Yeah, you can also get them on the precursors rings. Um, and uh, you can get absolutely astronomical returns on these. Um, I typically buy them somewhere between the 20 to 35 divine range again we're not buying these day one or two as i mentioned week two or three obviously our strategies with respect to investment scale throughout the league you can do them on day one you can do them on day 90 or you know arbitrarily 90 it ends up being about four months per league now it seems but hypothetically what would be 90. um but we can either use them for our own discharge build or we can sell them for 100 to 150 divines in you know two to three weeks uh, and what's actually one of the things I love about Discharge is that uh, the build scales off of things um, that other builds tend to want later, right? So Discharge gets all of its scaling from charges, which are basically from Corruptions or Synthesis mods, um, from Jewels, from Clusters, and from Flasks. So the things that you are pretty much forced to prioritize as a Discharge player are going to be super, super cheap because you have to get them first and nobody else is even looking at those markets. And then because you've got a bunch of them later on, you just get to sell them and they're 10 times the cost. So that was actually this, this kind of, I think bloomed out of that realization. As I mentioned, a lot of these things are sort of subconscious to me now, but um, if you can find yourself in a situation like that, where not only do you have an investment, but you, you can actively use it in a way that benefits uh, you, especially if that benefit uh, translates to an, a capacity to generate currency um, in terms of your you know, mapping or whatever um, in, in a greater way, all the better. Uh, for example, um, One Passive Voices, which is the last one I have written down here. This is something I pretty much buy every league, especially when I'm playing Discharge. They are almost always less than 100 Divines for the first couple of weeks of the league, and they are almost always somewhere between 350 and 500 Divines by the time the league ends. Not to mention, um, you know, it just gives you three additional jewel sockets. Any build in the game can benefit from that um, and can benefit in a tremendous capacity because of the strength of cluster jewels. Um, so not only is that, um, you know, investment one that has a absolutely bonkers return, but it's one whereby 
uh, you can have a, a use case for it that also will increase your capacity to generate currency moment to moment. And uh, that brings us to the end of slide, uh, or sorry, end, ending of video one. Um, I know that this was probably maybe a little bit frustrating to just watch me go through a slideshow like this, but I wanted to stay on message. Um, I also had that little preamble, so I thought it was uh, it was a good idea to uh, to kind of stick to the script um, and you know to to, to put in a, a real effort into this stuff here. Um, as you can see in the bottom there. Uh, I got a couple days left till my uh, till my 10 year anniversary, and um, I think it's probably pretty unlikely I'll hit that goal of 10,000 uh, subs on YouTube, but um, damn sure gonna try. So uh, I hope you guys enjoyed the content here. Um, if you guys want to know more, I'm going to make videos regardless. Um, but if if there are specifics about anything I discussed here or avenues you want me to go down, um, this is a very very rich and very dense topic. Uh, really the, the idea with this first video here was just to provide a framework for what it is, you know, um, and, and discuss it more in an abstract sense. Uh, now we can go down a variety of different routes here, right? We can discuss early league investment. We can discuss, um, investment by means of crafting investment by means of, uh, corrupting, you, you know, there's, there's tons of different manifestations, um, that this topic can go down. And, uh, so for that, I'd like to know what you guys think at least those of you who are interested the ones who aren't um well you know <laughs> uh that's okay too but um for anyone that does want to uh you know d d have have me explore this uh further let me know let me know what you, you uh you'd like to see um you know i've got a rough idea of where i'd like to go from here i have about four or five of these videos planned out uh in terms of um, again, each, each video, I would like to be kind of a feeder into the next video, um, so that the series sort of makes sense chronologically. Um, and, uh, so people again, aren't, you know, kind of forced to watch like an eight hour video, um, discussing such a broad topic. Um, but, uh, yeah, I would, I would love to see what, uh, you know, your guys thoughts are on this, um, or if you have any specific questions and, uh, yeah, I guess that's really it guys. Uh, thank you so much for tuning in. Um, for everyone that's, uh, supporting me, uh, you know, whether it's sub or follow or a Patreon or whatever, uh, again, I, I really do appreciate it guys. And, um, you know, any, anytime I'm kind of feeling down on myself, uh, like I just open my phone and I, I see a message being like, Hey man, like this has really improved the way that I interact with the game. And like, it's given me like a renewed vigor. Uh, I can't tell you how like meaningful that is to me. Um, and, uh, you know, the, the community that's kind of developed around, um, around this in the, in the short time that I've been making videos has been really, uh, uh, profoundly impactful for me. So, um, you know, regardless if it's financial or not, um, I, I, I do actually, you know, I'm grateful for all of you. Um, that being said though, hopefully this video was of interest, um, maybe helpful and, uh, let me know what you guys think. And, uh, I hope to see you, uh, see you again soon. Cheers lads.